admit, I, I don't know if you know the whole story on that. What happened was a good friend of ours, uh, um, uh, she have actually got into the, I think it was the ATF, like at school, like that, and then had an opportunity to do um, uh, a, a presentation like that for a possibility of a branded short film for the Tribeca Film Festival. And uh, we, I think we were doing actually, the, I think we were doing a benefit luncheon, I think up in Santa Barbara. And we came down to fly out of LAX to go back to Wyoming. And everybody in the house there, you know, we're all like uh, celebrating like that because she was one of the 10 finalists who had made it in like that, you know. And so I congratulated her. I said, that's really fantastic. That's wonderful. Look, and she goes, I'm so glad you feel that way because it's about you. <laughs> and, <laughs> And I said, what? Like, and she goes, yeah, yeah. She goes, it's about you going up in the mountains and the horses, you know, and looking for ideas and all this. Like, and, and she goes, and we got to come to Wyoming and film it. And I was like, when? And she goes, now. <laughs> it's due in two weeks. Like, and I was like, it's January. Like, and she goes, is that a problem? <laughs> and, and I was like, not for really tall horses, no. Like, and I said, but... <laughs> You know, I was, I was laughing about because Jamie's like, you know, they said, thanks so much for coming. And I'm like, you, you talk like, you know, Rancho Mirage is a tough sell, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. And I, and I was talking to Van out there, like who I did the, the did that wonderful uh, interview with me on the first day. like that, and, uh, and I told him, I said, I turned down an invitation like this from Wyoming in January. I am a divorced man <laughs> in U Cross, Wyoming. And let me tell you, the bench ain't real deep, okay? Like it's so, <laughs> my wife Judy's sitting over here on the corner to, you know, take care of me and make sure I do everything I'm supposed to do, like to stay out of trouble. Like that. And yeah, you know, the first thing I always get asked, the books have been translated into about 14 different languages. And so I'm overseas, you know, a, a lot like that. And uh, I had to think it was, it was kind of like strange to pull in and see the tank out there in the front like that. And um, because I, I got to admit that the only other member of my family that ever went over to Europe uh, was my uncle Harp who uh, actually disembarked on Anzio Beach in a Sherman tank like, and chased Germans all the way up Italy, um, across France, like uh, through Belgium and back into Germany. And then we lost him for two years because he discovered French women. And um, <laughs> we didn't hear from him for about two years or so. Then he finally came back, like, uh, but you know, it, it all kind of worked out. But, uh, but yeah, the, the big question I always get asked overseas, the first thing they always ask is, you know, are there only 25 people? And you cross like it, and then I have to fess up and say, "No, nah, they're only 19." <laughs> um, we did a head count one time like it, and came up with only about 19 people like it, and we think that the sign is still elevated from the last census is probably what it is like that. But uh, but yeah, that's 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 where I call home like it, and I have to admit that I'm always thinking about what's a story that kind of explains you know how my life has changed. Um, in, in writing the Walt Longmire novels, you know, in having, you know, things like the Tribeca Film Festival and the, the Netflix series and all these wonderful things that have happened. And there's only one story, I think, that probably illustrates that better than any other. Um, and that was, uh, we were actually at the beginning of one of our tours um, going up to Billings to get on a plane like that because my wife won't fly on the planes that fly out of northern Wyoming. <laughs> Um, because they're the kind where they hand you a leather helmet, you know, and goggles and say, jump in, you know, when the plane starts to move. Like, and so, you know, we were on our way up to Billings. Like, and a lot of times what we do is go over to Cody and start the tour, like at the Buffalo Bill Museum. If you ever get a chance, make sure you get to Cody, go over to the Buffalo Bill Museum. It's an absolutely magnificent center for the West. And so we're on our way up. Like, and for those of you who know the trail, like that, you know, we're on our way up there. Like that, and we stop in Red Lodge because I was hungry. And my wife knows that traveling with me is kind of like traveling with a trained bear. You know, as long as the bear is fed, everything will be okay. Like that. But if the bear gets hungry, things might go sideways pretty quick. So we stop in this little cafe, like that there in Red Lodge, okay? And so we go in and, uh, you know, we have lunch, like that. And I come over and I'm going to write a check for lunch, which kind of tells you what kind of a place it is. You can still write a check for lunch, right? So I'm over there and I'm writing a check for lunch. And when I'm not wearing one of these, I'm wearing one of those Absaroka County sheriff's department ball caps that we have on our website and what I euphemistically refer to as the, the Walt Mart, um, the store section. Like, and so, and it's like a brown ball cap, like, and it's got the emblem of the, you know, fictitious Absaroka County, you know, uh, sheriff's department on the front, like, and then it says Durant, Wyoming on the back. And so I've got one of those on, and mine's kind of like worn down, you know, it's kind of weathered out and everything. So I've got that on, and I've got my head down, and I'm writing a check for lunch, and the woman behind the counter, she goes, where'd you get that hat? 
And she said it real aggressive like, you know, and I thought, oh no, she thinks I'm a real sheriff's deputy and, you know, somebody's dined and ditched and I'm gonna have to go chase somebody down the main street of Red Lodge. Like, and I looked at her and I pointed at my head and I go, it's, it's not a real county. And she goes, the hell it's not, it's Walt Longmire's County. <laughs> So I felt like I had been smacked, you know, and so, so I looked at her and I go, well, yeah, I'm Craig Johnson. And she goes, so? <laughs> so I said, well, I'm the guy that writes the books. And she goes, what books? I get in so, and that, that's when that little voice in the back of my head said, you should just get out of here, you know? You should just take whatever shreds of dignity you've got left and just leave, you know? But my pride wouldn't let me do it. My author's pride wouldn't let me do it. And then I straightened my collar and I said, well, the books that the TV show is based off of. And I'll never forget her response. Like she looks at me and she goes, there are books? <laughs> and uh, I told Viking Penguin, I said, every time we go on tour, that's going to be, you know, that's going to be our opening remark. Yes, there are books. Okay, so... <laughs> But, uh, but it wasn't always that way. Like, it wasn't always that way at all. Like, it, Walt didn't, you know, precede me uh, the majority of my life. Like, it, and um, it's, it's been kind of interesting. Like, I mean, I met Sean Penn out in one of the parking lots, for God's sake. And as I was walking by, I said, hey, how you doing? He goes, Longmire guy. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, it's the hat, I guess. Like that. But anyway, like, it wasn't always that way. When I started out, you know, I mean, you know, like a lot of authors that you've probably heard uh, this week, like, I mean, you know, the, the big question is always, how did you become? an author. And I'm firmly of the belief that there are only two really honest answers to that question. The first one is, is that you stumble on to an idea, you know, that you think is worthwhile, something that's different, something that's maybe not been done to death, you know, and so it's something new. Look at, and then the other one is you finally run out of excuses is what happens. Like, that. because I mean, everybody in this room is a writer. I'm firmly of that belief. You know, Wallace Stegner used to say, you know, everybody's got that little ember, you know, in them that makes them a writer. The problem is generally they also have an editor inside them that strangles the writer to death before they get a chance to get anything down on paper. And I was kind of at that point, like that, you know, I'd built my ranch, you know, myself, like I'd built this little cabin about 24 by 36. I'd poured the concrete, stacked the logs, did it all myself, like that, and got it all kind of closed in. And I thought, you know what, maybe, maybe you should write this book that you've been thinking about. You know, this, this is a book about this, this sheriff, the sheriff of the least populated county in the least populated state. And uh, I, I look back at all the questions, you know, about my life, you know, and all the reactions that I've had. Pretty much everything I've done has been in reaction to something. And um, the reason how Walt kind of came into being was is that I, uh, I ran into two DCI investigators. That's a Division of Criminal Investigation in the state of Wyoming where we have one crime lab in the entire state. And I ran into these guys like that. And this was all back, you know, when the CSI stuff was really all the rage and everything. And so I asked them, I said, you know, I said, how long does it take you guys to get DNA evidence? And there was a long pause. And the one looked at me and said, you know, is this a, is this a high profile case? And I said, well, yeah, let's pretend like it's a high profile case. He says about nine months. <laughs> and so I was like, well, then that's not really particularly honest what they're doing in these TV shows and in these books and everything is no, no, it's not. And so I thought, okay, well, what if you did this? You know, what if it would work? Okay, so I sat down and I wrote the first two chapters of The Cold Dish, the very first Walt Longmire book. And they were horrible. They were the worst thing you've ever possibly read. Believe me, I know, I wrote them. And so, you know, I thought, well, why, why does this stink as badly as it does? You know, what's wrong with this? And I thought, you know what, you don't have any primary research material. You don't know enough about sheriffing. You need to go and talk to a sheriff. Like that. And so I drove the 18 miles into Buffalo, the county seat of Johnson County, my county, like that, and I get there. And this is before 9-11, like that, so there's no bulletproof glass, there's no computer rooms, there's nothing. There's just a wooden counter is all there was. And then there's a hallway with a door propped open and I can see a guy's cowboy boots up on his desk, you know, at the far end of the, you know, the, the hallway. And so I, I, I knock on the counter and this boy goes, what? And I said, hey, sheriff, could I talk to you for a minute? This fella comes out, Larry Kirkpatrick. He'd been the sheriff there for a number of years like that. And so I explained the situation. Hi, my name's Craig Johnson. I've got a little ranch out near U Cross and I'm uh, writing a murder mystery about a Wyoming sheriff. And I was wondering if you'd be willing to help me out with it. And so we talked for a little bit and he goes, I'm not, I don't know how much help I'm going to be with you, you know, to, for you in this stuff like that. And I said, well, I'm not looking for literary criticism. I'm looking for how it is that a rural sheriff would process a homicide investigation. And so we talk a 
little bit more, and he says, well, you know what? I've never done anything like this before, but I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a try. Like, so I went home, and I was so pleased and so secure in the fact that I had solved my problems that I added on to my house. <laughs> um, and then I built a shop and a barn and corrals and loading chutes and everything. And finally, like, you know, one day, like, I was, you know, coming back into the house, like, and I'm stomping around in the, you know, in the office there trying to find something. And I yanked the third drawer down on the right-hand side, and, and those two lonely little chapters of the cold dish were looking up at me. And 10 years had gone by. Yeah, so I don't want to hear any of that crap about writer's block, okay? Like that, I got to tell you. <laughs> So I pull those two lonely little chapters out, and I'm rereading them, and they are just as bad as I remembered them being 10 years previously. And I thought, well, this is going to be embarrassing. You're going to have to go in, and you're going to have to reintroduce yourself to this sheriff all over again. I knew he was still the sheriff. I hadn't spoken a word to him, but I'd voted for him three times. Like, and so I thought, this is going to really be embarrassing. Like, and so I hadn't girded my loins up to the point of actually doing it, right? And so you know, I go into town one day, like, and I'm just putting gas in my truck. And as I'm standing there at the pump island, um, this cruiser pulls in on the other side of the pump island. And this guy gets out, <laughs> you know, out of the squad car. Like, you know, and he tips his hat back just a little bit, drops his Ray-Bans down on the end of his nose, and he folds his arms and he's looking at me. And he's giving me this look that says, what did I arrest you for and when was it? <laughs> and so I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, oh, it's going to be even more embarrassing than I thought because it's going to be in public. And I stuck my hand out and I said, Sheriff Kirkpatrick, you're probably not going to remember me. And he goes, your name's Craig Johnson. You're the one who's got the little ranch out near Ucross. You're the one writing a murder mystery about a Wyoming sheriff. This was a 10-minute conversation from a decade previous. And I looked at him and I go, that is absolutely amazing. And he nods his head and he goes, yeah, yeah, if you don't mind me saying so, his book's going kind of slow. <laughs> <laughs> he had a point. <laughs> I had to admit, it pissed me off, but he had a point, you know, nonetheless. Like, and so I thought, all right, now, now, now's the time. Now you're going to have to get started on this thing. So I jumped in on this thing, you know, 100%. I was on this. I went back and I rewrote that first chapter. And I sent it in. By that time, they had this thing called the Internet. Like, and I had this card that he gave me at the gas station. And so what I did was I rewrote, 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 rewrote that first chapter. And then I sent it into the sheriff's department. It was like 1130 at night or something. It was really, really late. You know, but I, I wanted to get it into him as quick as possible. Like, and so I fired that thing off. It was about 11.20 at night or so. Like, and then I promptly just went to bed. You know, I thought, I'll hear from him when I hear from him. I get up the next morning. It's a ranch, you know, so I'm, I'm up early. Like, the animals won't wait. So I get everything squared away there at the ranch, and I come back into the house. I make a big pot of coffee, pour myself a mug of coffee, like that, and I walk out on the front porch. And this is my favorite part of the day. It's just beautiful. The sun's coming up over the Wolf Valley. Like at the Bighorn Mountains are behind me. Like at the cottonwoods are rustling. You know, the birds are just starting to come out from sleep. Like that, and I'm just standing there, like that, you know, watching the sun, like that, and drinking my coffee. And I hear something, something you just don't hear in you cross Wyoming. I hear a siren. And so I walk to the edge of the porch, look at, and I'm looking down the ranch road. At the very end of the ranch road, look at, there's a squad car with a four-wheel lock brake on, sliding to a stop, spinning, comes barreling up the ranch road at about 90 miles an hour, spraying dust, gravel everywhere as it goes, slides to a stop, the door flies open, Sheriff Larry steps out and says, I know who did it. <laughs> Well, I could think it was, I must be really crappy at this, you know? <laughs> and so I look at him, I go, Larry, you're only like one chapter into a 16-chapter book with an epilogue. Are you sure you want to guess now? And he goes, I'm a trained professional. I know who did it. <laughs> I was like, all right, who did it? He guessed, and he was wrong. <laughs> and I took a great deal of satisfaction in telling him that he was wrong, I got to tell you. Like I, and he just looks at me, and then he goes, damn. And then he just tosses his hat back in the car, climbs back in, turns around, and goes back down the ranch road. Didn't say another word to me. Like, and all I could think was, well, I've lost that source, haven't I? <laughs> you know? So I'm working on the next chapter. Like, and I'm working on the second chapter. Like, and I'm, you know, trying to get it done. Like, but it's kind of preying on my mind that I've lost, you know, my one source and, you know, real, you know, uh, of real, uh, you know, uh, background. Like, you know, be able to do this book. And so I'm working away, and I get the second chapter done, but I'm not going to make the same mistake twice, right? So it's like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, like that, and I hit send. Boom. I send it into the Johnson County Sheriff's Department. So off it goes. 20 minutes later, the phone rings. I pick up the phone. It's Sheriff Larry. I know who did it now. <laughs> 
I was like, Larry, you can't guess after every chapter. And he goes, hell, I can. It's my county. I can guess as many times as I want. <laughs> so I was like, all right, who is it? He guessed again. He was wrong again. <laughs> And he guessed after every single chapter, and he never did get it right. Like, and I looked at him, and I go, well, no, Larry, you're wrong again. Like, and he goes, well, you're just changing it every time I guess. Like, I, I was like, no, Larry, I got a 10-year-old outline I'm working from. He guessed after every single chapter, he never did get it right. Like that, and uh, I, I told him, I said, you know, well, you know, not only are you wrong, like that, but I said, you know, not only am I starting to feel pretty good about my abilities as a crime fiction writer, I'm starting to have some serious doubts about the Johnson County Sheriff's Department. Like that's so... <laughs> So he still reads the books to this day. Like I still send them to him. I don't send them to him chapter by chapter because I just can't put up with it. Like so, I just send him you know like one book at a time. Like that. But uh, then you know the book got picked up you know by Viking Penguin, um, which was really exciting. And they're the ones that kind of sat me down and said, "We really think you should think about doing this as a series. We think that the characters and the place and you know people are just they're going to want more. They're going to want more than this." And that's when I, with the knowledge of not even having had one book published. You know, uh, started arguing with the president of Penguin, saying, I don't think that'll work. I don't think that's a good idea. Um, she said, why don't you go back to your ranch and sit down and think about this? Look at, and so I did, look at, and, um, and so that's how the series kind of started. But the first book came out. Um, it got wonderful reviews. Look at, it sold really, really well. Look at, um, and then uh, one of the most exciting things ever happened, and I, I love telling this story because, you know, I'm in, I'm in a library. Look at, um, I got contacted by the very first library that ever, you know, I hadn't been in contact with, period, other than like to be told, shh, you know, so I, I, it was really exciting. It was from a little town over in the western part of Wyoming called Matitsi, um, which has a population of 327, so that's a big town in Wyoming, and, uh, and so they contacted me, and uh, Diana Chapman, she wrote me this email, and she said, hey, we've just read your book, The Cold Dish, and we would love to have you come over and do a library event at our Matitsi library, like, and I immediately wrote her back and said, I will be, I'd be delighted to come and do a, a library event for you guys. Like, and she wrote me back three minutes later and said, just so you know, we're just a little branch library over here in Park County, and we don't have a lot of money for honorarias or anything, and so I wanted to let you know that before you agree to do it. So I, I quick looked up what an honoraria was, and, um, <laughs> and, then, and then wrote her back and said, you know, well, once you reach a certain level of literary notoriety, it's very difficult to negotiate your own contract. I said, mine's the same as it's always been, a six-pack of Rainier beer cans preferred. <laughs> um, she wrote me back in two minutes that next time and said, done. Like, and kind of made me think I might have undersold myself a little bit there. Like that. But uh, the problem was this got in all of the newspapers in Wyoming. <laughs> Subsequently, I have done all 63 of the libraries <laughs> in Wyoming. <laughs> including the one that my Wyoming compatriot back here knows so well, like that, because she was like, well, have you ever been to Daniel? And I was like, yeah, the Green River Bar, <laughs> the amazing slaw dog. Like it, and it's, it's all kind of like Wyoming legend. Like that, and when it was one of the ones that they had me do for the state read. I did the first state read for the state of Wyoming. And when they gave me the list, it had like about 12 different libraries on it from the big cities, you know, in Wyoming. And I said, you know, for a, an author from a town of 25 to only go to the big towns, that's not going to work. Like that, I got to go to the small ones too. And so they sent me to Daniel which has a population of, I think, about 30. Like, and so um, I knew by personal experience that they had a post office and a bar in Daniel. Like, and so I, I told them, I said, well, now, you know, eh, there's no library in Daniel. And they went, oh, contraire. There is a shelf of books behind the pool table in the bar. <laughs> and what you do is you go and you take a book out, you go over and you check it out with the bartender, and then you bring it back whenever you're... <laughs> through reading or too drunk to read, one of the two. Like, and so, so, but that was fun, like that, because I got to go to all the different little places in Wyoming like, and uh, had a grand time, like, and it was with the State Library. Um, and I kind of had a reputation like that of you know, being very, you know, a big advocate of, of literacy and for the libraries. And one of the fun things was is I actually got to go down to uh, the State Library in Cheyenne. And the, you know, the governor was there, the attorney general, everybody. It was really a, a fun event. Um, but what was really uh, kind of embarrassing was is the, uh, the state librarian, um, before I got started on the event, comes out and sets this package on the podium. And let me tell you how much librarians like bringing beer into their libraries. Like they, they wrap it up in brown paper with twine and packing tape and everything. I mean, by the time they're done with it, it looks like heroin is what it looks like, you know, for God's sake. And so anyway, she brings it out and she sits it down and she goes, this was really kind of hard to get. Like, and I said, well, 
yeah, I know, it's kind of a working class, blue collar beer. You know, a lot of the bars don't carry it anymore. And she goes, no, you don't understand. They're out of beer. Like that. And I said, well, yeah, I know. If the, li- I mean, if the bars don't carry it, then the distributors don't carry it. She goes, no, no, you don't understand. The brewery is out of beer. <laughs> this was two weeks into the TV show Longmire. <laughs> and everybody saw Walt drinking Rainier beer. And they all went out and bought it. <laughs> I don't know if they drank it, but they bought it, you know. <laughs> it's always a little embarrassing because I get all these emails from people that, you know, are coming over from, like, you know, these beer countries like Belgium, Germany, you know, Czechoslovakia, places like that, Czech Republic. Like that. And, they, and they always write me and they go, we are so excited. We are finally coming to Wyoming and we are going to drink a Rainier beer. <laughs> and I'm like, don't get your hopes way up, really, you know. <laughs> But uh, anyway, like that, you know, it, it was it was wonderful. Like I mean, this thing, this TV show happened, like that, and uh, and I, I thought, you know, what this sounds a little funny. I'm going to check it out, like that. And so I called up the national headquarters for Rainier Beer, like that, and I called him up on the phone, and I said, hey, you know, what's the story? Are you guys having a problem with it? He goes, we are out of beer. We have had a spike in sales, unlike anything we've ever had before. In, uh, we've been brewing this stuff since Prohibition broke, and we've never sold this much beer, and we have no idea what's going on. <laughs> and I said, well, we have what we call in my business a clue. Like, and so I told him about, you know, Longmire, Rainier Beer, you know, the character that I write, the sheriff, and all this kind of stuff. And so we finish up, and it's a nice, wonderful conversation going on for about five or ten minutes. And then by the end of the, the conversation, he, he, he makes it clear to me, he goes, well, don't worry because we're in full production. So it'll be back out on the shelves here in about four days, which kind of gives you an indication of how long it takes to make Rainier beer, okay? (laughs) I mean, if you're thinking it's aging in fine oak casks, you know, (laughs) up in ice caves in the Olympic Peninsula, you need to get past that. Like I I gotta tell you, like that. But yeah, then that was like I guess the next big step was uh, all of the excitement, you know, with with Longmire, like that. And uh, and it was it was kind of interesting. I gotta admit, you know, because uh, you know I, I remember you know Warner Brothers knocking on the door, like it and saying, hey, you know, we would like to make a TV show, you know, out of your books. And I remember meeting, you know, with you know the producers and getting to meet everybody before you know the ball got rolling or before I had to sign on a dotted line or anything. And they were very interesting people, like they're very intelligent, like and they had track records of all these shows that they had already done, Nip Tuck and uh, The Closer and all these other shows like that. And so um, I remember talking with them like that and, uh, and I remember they were asking me all these questions about Wyoming and Walt and, you know, uh, you know Western sheriffing, the Cheyenne, you know, Indians up in, across the border in Montana, all these different things like that. And uh, I, I did what, you know, you normally do in those situations, which is, you know, you know when you're in a job interview, ask some questions of your own. And my big question was, Why? <laughs> Why are you guys wanting to make a TV show about the sheriff of the least populated county in the least populated state like that? And I I think Greer, you know, really kind of summed it up and kind of summed up, you know, the, you know, what happened, you know, with the TV show, the the, the amazing response that it got. She goes, you know, we've kind of been in this anti-hero thing since the 1960s, you know, and I think that, you know, maybe people are ready for, you know, a a true blue ribbon kind of hero, a guy that's, you know, not perfect, you know, but one that's not, you know, making methamphetamines in his bathtub or burying bodies in the backyard or something like that, but somebody who's like, you know, really kind of, you know, cares, you know, about the constituency that, that he serves, like it, and cares about the laws, like it, that he's there to, you know, to, to make sure get enforced, like it. And she said, I think we're kind of ready for that. And that kind of sold me on the idea. I thought, okay, well, maybe they do get it. You know, maybe, maybe they do kind of get what it is I'm trying to do with these books. And so anyway, they asked me, one of the big things they asked me was, they said, you know, well, who do you, do you ever think about actors whenever you think about Walt Longmire? And I said, no. <laughs> I said, you know, we don't have any movie theaters in Ucross, like that, so, you know, I mean, everything I watch is like, you know, 40, 50 years old. Like, I didn't, is there color? Is it color movies now, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, she said, well, if you were to think about actors to play Walt Longmire, who do you think of? Like, and I was like, I, I don't have any, uh, Joel McRae. Joel McRae would be a good Walt Longmire. Like a, um, ben Johnson. Ben Johnson would be a good Walt Longmire. Like a, uh, Gary Cooper. 
Gary Cooper would be a good Walt Longmire. And they said that was no help at all because all those guys had been dead for 40 years. Like, so I told them, I said, I'm not going to be any help to you guys like, in doing this. Like, and so I got out of that one, I thought. I thought I got out of it. Like that. And so there was one evening where Judy and I were sitting there at the ranch, like, you know, and uh, we're at the kitchen table, and all of a sudden you know, there's a knock on the door, like, and it's the poor FedEx guy. Like, you know, and he's dropping off an overnight package from Warner Brothers. And so, you know, I get the package, I bring it in, like, and I open the box, I dump it out, it's DVDs of all of the auditions for all of the actors they're looking at for Walt Longmire, which is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, generally, Hollywood does not care what, you know, the novelist thinks, right? Um, which kind of gives you a little bit of an indication of what kind of producers these were. These were pretty wonderful folks. And, uh, and so anyway, this, this, this whole, you know, box full of DVDs is laying there on the kitchen table. And I look at Judy and I said, well, I guess we have some homework to do tonight. Look at, and so I, I, you know, take the DVDs out and I'm putting all the DVDs, you know, in the DVD player. And we're watching all these guys uh, attempt to be Walt Longmire, you know. And, uh, you know, there, there, some of them are big names, you know, and some of them are unknowns, you know. And, and I got to admit, you know, there were problems with casting in both those directions, like in the sense that... Um, if you go with a big name, you know, you guys know as well as I do that, you know, that especially when you've got a character that wears one of these, there are about a half a dozen guys out there in Hollywood that get the role anymore. They just get it over and over and over again. So you don't really look at them as the character anymore. You look at them as this conglomeration of all these cowboy roles that they've already played. And so I was kind of rooting for the unknown guy was what I was rooting for. And the difficulty with that, of course, is, is that Walt is of a certain age. You know, any actor that's going to play Walt's going to have to be, what, 50, 60 years old, right? I mean, he's a Vietnam vet. So he's got to be of a certain age. So the actor has to be of a certain age. And so the difficulty with that, of course, being that if you're an actor and you're in Hollywood and you're 50 or 60 years old and you're still unknown, <laughs> <laughs> you might suck, you know? And <laughs> Hollywood's really nervous about the whole suck thing, I got to tell you. Like, and so... So anyway, like, you know, I'm kind of rooting for the unknown guy, like, but we're going through all these DVDs, you know, and, and in the episode, like, it's actually the pilot episode where, you know, Walt is going and doing a notification of death is what he's doing. It's, uh, it's the worst job in law enforcement. It's like where you get to go to someone's home and tell them that their loved one is, they're, they're never going to see them again. It's just the worst job in the world. Like, and so um, all these actors are doing a good job, but they're just not really clicking for me. And I get to the very last DVD, and I'm pretty sure that's the way they planned it when they rubber banded them together. And I pulled that last one out and it says Robert Taylor on it. And I turned to Judy and I said, well, they took my advice after all, didn't they? Like that, so <laughs> thank God some of you got the Robert Taylor joke because the under 30 crowd does not get it at all. Like I gotta tell you, like that, so. <laughs> so anyway, like, you know, I, I put the DVD in and this guy comes on. And he's a you know, tall guy, like that, you know, he's handsome, like that, you know, gravelly voice. But the great thing about him is he's got lines on his face. You know, he looks like he's got mileage on him. And I'm thinking, you know, wow, you know, this might be the guy. And then he sealed the deal. Um, in the scene, what he's doing is he's walking into this woman's house to tell her that her husband is dead and he's never coming home. And he's never met this woman before. He's never been in her home. And Robert Taylor was the only actor that did this. He took off his hat. And I was like, that's our guy. You know, basic civility. We don't have to teach him. Like that, I would thought, now there it is, there it is. And it was right about then that my wife sitting behind me went, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> and I turn around, and I look at her, and she goes, he's handsome. <laughs> <laughs> and then she turns around, and makes it even worse than it already was. Like that, she goes, he's kind of like a TV version of you, taller, better looking, with a better voice. Like that, so, so. <laughs> I'm not as big of a fan of Robert Taylor as maybe I used to be, I have to admit, at this point in time. Like that. But I have to admit, like that, just to finish up here and allow you guys to ask a few questions here at the tail end, um, that for me, it's always kind of important, and all the wonderful things that have happened, you know, with Hollywood and with the TV show and, you know, all of these wonderful things, I, I can never help but feel just a little bit sorry for Hollywood because I have this one incredible weapon that, that they, I mean, they've got all of the money in the world, like, and they do their sets, and they can hire these actors, and they can do costumes, and locations, and special effects, and music, and all these wonderful things, but I have this one thing that kind of, you know, goes past everything that they have. It's called the reader's imagination, is what it's called, because that's what I do. 
you know, I stack the words up, just like dominoes. I get in that imagination of yours, and I stack those dominoes up word by word by word, and then I just try and use the right word. Not too many, not too few, but just hopefully the right one to just tip over that first domino of your imagination, and then you do all my work for me. Thank you. Now, at this point in time, what I always do, like it is open it up and let you guys ask some questions. Like it, and uh, you can ask me about anything. It doesn't really matter. Like it, you can ask me about um, the, the, the books, the TV shows, you know, life abroad, whatever. It really doesn't matter. Like at what's life in you cross like or anything you'd like. I'm happy to answer all your questions. Yes, ma'am. You were pretty quick, so I'll, I'll call on you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it's the sixth season. The sixth season right now is the last. Like that, um, what's happened is, is um, it was very curious. Like that, because uh, when the TV show came out, the original network was A and E, um, and so we were on basic cable. Um, and then what happened you know, was uh, we were kind of a surprise hit, and became the highest-rated scripted drama that A and E had ever had in the history of their network. And then after three years, they promptly rewarded us by canceling us. And um, the, the reason for that was is that they got into a battle with A&E, Warner Brothers did. A&E wanted to own the show, and uh, Warner Brothers wouldn't sell it to them. And so they said, well, we're going we're gonna to cancel the show if you don't sell it to us. And Warner said, well, you're going to look kind of silly canceling the highest rated scripted drama you've ever had. And what I've learned is don't ever try and underestimate the intelligence of television executives is what I've learned. Like that in that um, they will cut their nose right off despite their face. Like, and so they did. And uh, at that point in time, Peter Roth, who's the head of uh, Warner, um, and also this magnificent group called the Longmire Posse, like that, that put a great deal of effort into making sure this TV show got picked back up again, um, actually made a call over like that. And uh, I remember talking with him and him saying that, you know, well, it looks like we're going to go with this streaming service. And I was like, yeah, if you don't know if you remember, that was back early on. And I said, you know, what, what do you mean a streaming service? And he says, well, they'll be able to watch Longmire on their phones, on their TVs, I mean, I mean on, their, on their computers and all this. And I was like, oh, that's, that's going to be a failure. That's never going to work. <laughs> well, that was Netflix. Like, uh, so <laughs> don't ever take my advice or any stock tips or anything like that, for goodness sake. Like, uh, but, uh, but yeah, and then, the, then what happened was we got picked up with Netflix. We were pretty much trending practically, you know, uh, every night, you know, for like about three years. And then what happened? Netflix wanted to buy Longmire, like, and uh, Warner Brothers once again would not sell uh, the television show. Like, and so they finished off with their sixth season, but they kind of left, you know, an awful lot of strings open. I mean, I think they did a wonderful job kind of closing off, but leaving the opportunity for TV movies or, you know, potential work for later on. So it's, it hasn't been the end of us before. It might not be the end of us again. <laughs> you never can tell. Like, and so, <laughs> so yes, ma'am. How did I meet Judy? I was actually, I, you know what? She went to the uh, Pennsylvania State Fair, and I was the booby prize is what it was. Like, <laughs> and uh, actually, I was doing graduate work in Philadelphia, like, and that's you know, where, I, where I got her. It's funny that you should key in on that, though, because I have to admit, of all the successes that I've had, trying to get my New England-born, Philadelphia-raised wife to move to Ucross, Wyoming. Like, uh, that was the trick. <laughs> that was a dicey proposition there. Like that. But uh, she actually loves it. Like, uh, she actually... Uh, so she was happy to, to kind of make that change. So... <laughs> yes, ma'am. Cowboying. I was cowboying, like up in Montana, actually. And that, that first time, I'd, I'd gone through Wyoming, but I hadn't really spent much time there. And then what happened was, is, uh, I was working for a rancher up in Montana, and I uh, delivered horses down into what we euphemistically refer to as the UCLA area, which is U Cross, Claremont, Leiter, and Arveda. <laughs> and, uh, and if you add them all up together, you have about 300 people like that. But, uh, but I just fell in love with that spot. It's like right there where Clear and Piney Creeks runs in together at the base of the Bighorn Mountains. Um, it's, it's a little bit lower because it's in those foothills right at the base of the Big Horns. So it's green. There's water. There are trees, you know, aspens, cottonwoods, you know. But it's still, you know, I, I drive into town. I might pass one other car or pickup truck going the other way. And they will wave, you know, as they go by, whether I know them or not. Like that. And uh, if you don't wave back, you'll get home and there will be a phone message that says, you didn't wave, is there a problem? Like, are you okay? <laughs> you know, which is really kind of a wonderful thing to have happen, I have to admit. Yes, ma'am. 
I have written 15 books, two novellas, and a collection of short stories. <laughs> so I've been relatively prolific. Like, and I think I've kind of kind of stayed on it. I, I always laugh whenever I hear a lot of these literary authors that say, you know, that they put out a book like once every seven or eight years. I'm like, you're not working very hard, are you? Like, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, for me, like that, it's, it's just a, an essential part of the process. Like, I mean, I, I really love writing. I really enjoy doing it. Um, now, granted, I've got a balance there because I've got a ranch, like, and so I've got you know physical labor and stuff to do outside, um, and then I've got the intellectual work, like, and you know the, the esoteric work of like you know sitting down at the computer and writing, and so it's a nice balance. Like, it's a really kind of a wonderful balance to have. I have to admit. So I should go back here. Yes, ma'am. The Native Americans, look at, I, I mean, where, where I am, they're like, you know, right there to the north of me. The Northern Cheyenne and the Crow Reservation are just north of me. Like, and so it, there's no way that I could not have them you know, not be a part, you know, of, you know, the, the, the books in that world, you know, that I write. Um, they're an essential part of that whole process, you know, as far as I'm concerned. And, and I can go down the list, you know, of, of all of the Native characters are in my books. And I do say the name, I, I do use the word Indian because whenever I use the term Native American when I'm around my Northern Cheyenne buddies, they always look at me and go, where were you born? <laughs> and I always say, well, I was born in America. So you would be a Native American too then, wouldn't you? Look at, so, so for them, it's much more important for you to make sure that you get the tribal designation's correct. You don't want to call somebody who's Northern Cheyenne, Assiniboine, or somebody who's Crow, you know, Shoshone, or something like that. You want to make sure you get it right. But um, for me, like, uh, they're a really essential part of that world, you know, where I live, like that. And um, their philosophies and the mysticism, spirituality that they have that's such a part of, you know, their day-to-day -day life um, is another part that I think is absolutely essential, you know, to what it is that I do. Um, another big thing is their humor. I don't think there's ever been a group of individuals that's, you know, ever been as maligned as the American Indian as not having a sense of humor. And I think I commented on it, you know, just, you know, uh, on Thursday, like that the fact that, you know, they have had to have a really great sense of humor because they've been putting up with us for a couple of hundred years, right? Like, and so um, it, it's, you know, they're always portrayed as these, like, you know, cigar store Indians, you know, this, uh, you know, this, this stoic, you know, how, you know, kind of character. And that's, that's just not the Indians I know. The Indians I know work on about 17 different layers of irony. And if you're not aware of that irony, you get to be the butt of that irony. Like, and so I'm very sensitized to it. Like, that, it's, uh, it's kind of essential. It's different in the books a little bit than it is, you know, in the TV show. I think that they, they, they focus more on the dramatic conflict of the clash of two cultures, you know, more uh, than, than, than I do. Like, for me, it's, you know, I, I talk about the clash of those two cultures and deal with the clash of those two cultures, but an awful lot of the time I use a lot of humor to kind of take the edge off of it just a little bit. So, you bet. Did they ever consider the role for the role of Walt Long? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh no, 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 no. One of these years, I'll get Robert Taylor to come out here to this with me. Like you know, it will be like I'm not even here. Like I got to tell you, like that. So we do have this thing called Longmire Days up in Buffalo, Wyoming, where we have like the entire cast from the TV show. They come up to this little town of 4,000 people, along with about 20,000 of their closest friends, <laughs> and uh, it's like. I think in the third week in July, I think this year, like that, and it's every bit the disaster you're imagining right now. It really is. I mean, to imagine a small town in Wyoming suddenly with a bunch of TV stars, you know, and movie stars and 20,000 extra people. Like, you know, the, the, the banks all run out of money. The ATM machines run out of money. Um, the, 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 the restaurants and the grocery stores all run out of food. Like that, uh, there isn't a hotel room to be had for 90 miles around. And everybody walks around with their cell phones because they've overridden the bandwidth of the poor little tower there in Buffalo. And they're all looking at the little circle of death, you know, going around and around and around. Like and I'm always walking up to them, yeah, why doesn't Walt carry a cell phone, huh? <laughs> you know, they start to get the idea after that. Like that, so, so, and we got time for maybe, maybe a couple more questions, I guess. Like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Uh, 
Oh, well, he wasn't really the basis. He was like, you know, there were a lot of different, you know, uh, sheriffs that I did ride-alongs with in Wyoming and Montana. Um, and, you know, what, one of my, you know, I mean, it, obviously there's the, the great quote by Wallace Stegner where he says, you know, the greatest piece of fiction ever written is the disclaimer at the beginning of every book that says nobody in this book is based off anybody alive or dead. And what a crock that is. Like, you know, um, that's your job to go find interesting people and put them in your books. Like, and so sometimes you can do that, but sometimes you have to kind of do what I call a, a Dr. Frankenstein, where you take like bits and pieces of a lot of different people and put them together, you know, to make the character that you need. And that's kind of what I did with Wald, um, to be honest. But it's, it's a great place to be because it's not, it, it's not, everybody doesn't live in the same houses, driving the same cars, going to the same jobs in Wyoming. I mean, it's a, it can be a strange place. Like that, and that's really what I, I love about it. I love the margins. I love being out there on that emotional geographical frontier, you know, where you have the fun of like, you know, putting the marginal characters in there. And, uh, and it's, it's one of those places, give me an example, like that, um, when I was talking with Larry, like, uh, you know, he said, you got a mistake in the first chapter. And I said, what's that? And he goes, you got people drinking beer out of bottles in a bar out on the Powder River. It's can only bars on the Powder River. And I said, why is that? And he says, because you can't throw a can and hurt somebody. <laughs> and <laughs> I was like, well, what about a full can? And he shook his head and he goes, Craig, nobody in Wyoming ever threw a full can of beer. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh huh. You know, I actually, I actually was. I actually was. I was one of those Cinderellas, you know. And I, I like telling that story um, simply because I, I think that there are a lot of people out there like that that you know that think you know. I mean, you hear the stories of like you know, oh, I slave for thirty years, you know, and I, my walls of my house are completely papered with rejection, you know, notices from all of these different publishers and agents and all of this. Every once in a while, lightning strikes. Like that. Every once in a while, like that. I got picked up by a huge agent, um, you know, there in, in New York. Like at Gail Hockman, like that. You know, who passed me over to Catherine Court, the president of Penguin. And within a year and a half, I think it was, I was on the shelves. Um, and so miracles do happen. It, it, it does happen every once in a while. Like that. So don't don't give up. You know, for those of you who are writing out there, the only way it dies is if you put it in the drawer <laughs> and close it. <laughs> And don't find it for 10 years. Then it's another story. Like it. So I want to do one more real quick. We've got 30 seconds. Who's got a one quick question? Yes, sir. We love your intense research and the way you're involving yourself with this cowboy and, and real America. And it reminds me of William Moore. Oh. No, no, no. He was actually, by the time I got around to, you know, actually thinking about being a writer, I'm afraid that he was already gone. But uh, I, I got to admit, I've got one quick, I'll, I'll finish up with this one quick Louis L'Amour story. There was one ranch that I worked on up in Montana. I, they actually, Cowboys and Indians Magazine got in touch with me and said, do you have any Louis L'Amour stories? Because we're having a special Louis L'Amour edition. And I said, absolutely, I do. But I don't know if it's the one you want. And they said, well, let's hear it. Look at it. And so what happened was I was working for this ranch up in Montana. And uh, what happens usually, you know, in, when you get around to the fall, like that, um, they have too many, you know, too many men working. Like that. And so generally what happens is the younger cowboys get the boot. You know, you get kicked off free, like that, and they hang on to the older cowboys because they would have a rougher time finding a job and making it through the winter. Like that. And so I was getting fired, basically, was what happened. Like that. And so I go up, you know, and the big thing was that the rancher there, he was always a great guy. He would invite you up to the big house, like that, and take you into the study, and he'd have a fire going like that, you know, and he'd pour you a tumbler of whatever it is that you happen to want, you know, and, you know, sit down and talk with you, just to give you the idea that, you know, it wasn't that you did anything wrong. It's just that there wasn't any work for you through the winter. And so I'm sitting there and I'm looking around at the walls like and they've got all he's got all these leather bound books that go all the way around the room and everything. And one whole wall is like nothing but Louis L'Amour, who is just an absolutely magnificent writer, just a fantastic writer, doesn't get the credit you know, that he deserves. And, uh, and I look over there and I look at all those Louis L'Amour books like and I said, have you read every single one of these? And he goes, yes, I have. I have read every single one of those. Like and I said, wow. And he goes, yep. And if one more son of a bitch makes one more fire under a tree to dissipate the smoke so the Indians don't get him, I'm going to throw it into the fireplace. Like, and so <laughs> it was a valuable opportunity for me to learn. No matter how good you are, don't repeat yourself. Like, and so <laughs> thank you guys so much. <laughs> oh, my pleasure, Jamie.